Okay, so I'll give it a few more minutes until everyone can get here. All right, um, hopefully this screen share is going okay and you, can, you guys can all see it. Um, all right. Uh, before I get going too much in terms of my talk, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Seddon Thomas. I'm a research application scientist. I just joined Pythonix in January and um, I uh, have a background in immunology and I wanted to emphasize at any point, please ask questions during the talk. I'll be able to see them on the screen. Um, and also, um, we really want to hear from you. So if you have questions about how we can help you with your experiments, please um, reach out. So um, I wanted to talk to you today about an introduction to the NOVA floors and really step back and think about what if you could design um, a fluorescent label, um, really design it from scratch. That's one of the conversations that I had with Mike um, as I was joining the company. What, you know, if you could choose what um, the label would be, um, how it would work, what, you know, would you uh, choose? Um, so I'll give you a second to sort of think about that. Um, and in terms of answering that question, you'd want it to be uh, bright, but also clean so you can distinguish what you're seeing. Um, you want it to be um, consistent and stable. Um, so, you know, in terms of bright and clean, you, you know, it's the same uh, brightness and the same uh, channel of fluorescence that you're looking at. Um, and also really, if you could uh, choose what you're doing, to look at a controllable brightness. So um, optimize that for the antigen density, or um, if you have a very low expressed marker, um, be able to really tune that. And um, so it was really one of the things that I got excited about in terms of uh, joining Phytonics, this idea that we could really look at what dyes are out there and um, really uh, design uh, the fluorescence and um, how, how bright we want it to be in our panel. So um, it's really pretty exciting to think about that. So once you have this uh, fluorescent label, um, what would you think about in terms of panel design? So we still have other labels out there. Um, and um, <clears throat> really you have to think about spectral overlap. Um, and um, so in the first case, for instance, even if you have a bright label, as I was mentioning before, in terms of choosing that, um, if it's bright but spreads into everything else, you really can't detect the other signals. So again, um, you know, basically making that uh, a very specific um, 
inflorescence. Um, also, we have to look at dye performance um, in terms of what, how does it match with antigen density, as I was mentioning before. Um, and then there are other issues with, um, you know, looking at the staining index in terms of how bright the dye is, and also um, what happens in terms of compensation and spillover. So these are all things that we as scientists think about now all the time, even if we're not specifically thinking about that. Um, we have to incorporate it into our panel design. So it's there, and part of the reason it's there is because of the dyes that are available. Um, hold on. Sure. Okay. There we are. Um, and so dye performance is um, related to the, um, <clears throat> sorry, there's uh, something going on my screen. Um, so dye performance is really related to the uh, excitation from the lasers. So here you can see all the lasers that are um, available currently. So um, most, of the, most of us really focus on the five in the middle, the um, UV through the red. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, sorry, um, my screen is bogging down. One, one moment. All right, I'm <laughs> not sure what's going on with that, but it seems to be working now. So again, um, there really are mostly these, these five lasers that we're focusing on um, in terms of dyes. And so what are the issues that we have to think about in relation to uh, dyes? So we talk about compensation all the time in terms of designing panels. Um, but what does you know, compensation come from? It comes from the spillover of that spectrum, as I was showing you, but also the cross-excitation of lasers. And so what you can see here, again, focusing on these five lasers, is that most dyes that are currently available um, are also cross-excited, not only by the laser that we want them to be excited by, but also by um, a, a second or th even third laser. And this um, is something that SciTech has been actually been able to take great advantage of in terms of looking at the signature. So, um, you know, if this is excited by multiple dyes, seeing like where this that's happening. Um, but in terms of thinking about designing dyes um, up until this point, when you haven't been looking at signatures, but rather a narrow, you know, spectrum uh, as designed uh, from the um, filter set that you're using, you really want it to just fluoresce in that channel and uh, not fluoresce elsewhere. So um, this is one of the things that you have to think about. And we've focused on that in terms of um, at Phytonics, uh, our initial dye release is really focused on the blue and yellow green because it's a real issue. There aren't uh, really any dyes um, that are solely um, Able, able to be used just in one channel or the other. So um, there are uh, blue dyes that are excited off the blue laser, but most of the PE and PE tandems that we often use um, are basically excited also by the blue laser. And so this leads to a problem with cross excitation. And so uh, this is just further showing you an example using uh, Cytex system where you can see um, this spread that's introduced um, when you're looking at a specific dye. So there's the primary detector channel um, and the excitation there, and then um, spread that either comes from um, basically the fluorescence that's very broad in that channel or even uh, excitation from other um, lasers that um, may affect the dye's performance. And so just as a further example of that, these are some dyes that are all coming off of the blue laser. And um, what you can see here is that um, Percy P, uh, BB515, BB700, they're all distributed in terms of their primary channel um, from coming from the blue laser and they have somewhat unique uh, fluorescences in the case of, uh, sorry, BB515, uh, um, but Percy P and BB700 are similar, but you can see there's a lot more spread that comes uh, in the BB700 fluorescence. So if you're looking at incorporating that dye into um, your panel, it's um, 
difficult because you're actually using up some portion of uh, what you'd be able to detect and that um, creates a problem that we've been looking at um, trying to resolve. And I think everyone is pretty familiar with what happens with um, PE and the PE tandems. I mean, they're great in terms of the brightness, um, being able to look at uh, markers that are dim. But the problem is that often those of us that have um, multiple channels coming off the yellow green laser can often only use say two of those like six channels if you're looking say at a Fortessa or something like that um, because of the fluorescence that spreads into uh, channels either from other lasers or even within the yellow green laser itself, the brightness there. So when we look back at the requirements um, for uh, designing the, uh, the best dye, um, we really want it to be, again, PE is a great example of that. We want our dyes to be bright and clean and um, really excited by the laser that they're designed to be excited by. Um, PE is going to be excited by both the blue and the yellow green lasers, so that's already an issue. So it makes a great signature um, in terms of the system that SciTac has um, for detecting those signatures. But when we really think about, you know, looking at questions that we're interested in in science, it's, it's difficult. Um, and so um, in terms of looking at really changing how dyes um, are targeted, we at Phytonics have a platform and it's called the Phyton and it makes use of uh, single-stranded DNA um, that can then be assembled um, in conjunction with specific fluorophores um, and into this cruciform structure that you see here in the center. Um, and this enables us, enables us to tune uh, the frequency of emission. So um, use, using this structure, we can actually induce specific and defined fret um, between different fluorophores and um, have those actually emit by design, so be excited with the laser that we want them to be excited by and emit in the channel that um, we want to see. So that's one of the things that we've really been doing. Um, and I say we, we've got a team of, of um, chemists along with people that have an engineering background. It's really a great place to work in terms of having this breadth of knowledge. Um, and so, you know, the, we're really addressing that using this Phyton label. So um, we can tune the excitation and emission um, again and conjugate those to antibodies, um, tune the brightness, um, and I'll talk more about that as I go forward. Um, and then even generates uh, specific signatures. Um, so that's one of the things that we're also looking at as we go forward. Um, so it's really very exciting in terms of the possibilities that are there. So um, this is getting into more of the details of our specific dyes that we're in the process of releasing. So you can see these are the Nova Blues. The naming uh, uh, conventions um, are straightforward. So Nova Blue referring to the excitation coming from the blue laser and um, the emission um, being either um, at the 530, 610, or 660. And um, what's unique about these dyes is, again, that they are excited um, either by the blue or the yellow laser and not a combination there in which is what happens with PE. So you can see, I'm going to uh, go ahead to the Nova yellow dyes, and you can see that the spectrum um, changes very little between those. But what is changing is what laser they're excited by. So this allows us to stack um, the kinds of dyes that we're using. So what does that, what does stacking mean? So when you think about PE, part of the problem is that it's excited both by the 488 laser as well as the 561. And so you're going to have fluorescence in both of those uh, channels coming from those lasers, um, the, the channels um, where PE emits. That is. Um, however, if you're using our dyes, you can go um, and use a specific dye in the blue, um, excited off the blue laser, and then one excited off the yellow laser. So you can actually um, increase what you're able to see. And it's really very exciting to be able to look ahead at what we'll be able to do using this, um, even in you know your normal panels. So if you have a you know a panel where you're using you know 
FTSE, PE, and a number of other labels, even be able to expand just what you're doing there in your conventional um, cytometer is uh, pretty astounding. So, um, you, you know, I'm telling you about this, but you can also look for yourself if you're interested um, at where uh, the excitation and emission fluorescences are. So these are public. Um, and this is FP base, which is a great resource uh, as you're looking at panel design and seeing, okay, does this, you know, work for my panel or not? Um, and so this um, is available. Our dyes are in it. You can see what's going on. And right here, this is this is the, our one core dyes that you can see. Um, and I'll go more into what that means um, going forward. But um, our dyes are also available in the SciTech uh, Spectrum Viewer. And so this is another way to look at what's, what you're seeing. So in the one case, you can see with the excitation and emission um, specifically um, here, it's showing you just the emission and you're seeing the um, emission across the UV, uh, violet, blue, uh, yellow, green, and red labels. So um, this actually is a great tool for building out your panel and really understanding what you're seeing in terms of um, you know, how narrow the spectrum is and also what other cross-excitation or spillover that you might have as when you're designing your panel. So um, I've talked a bit about the dyes, but what, you know, what have we actually found in terms of uh, the staining? So uh, Steve Perfetto at the NIH has done some of the testing for us. And um, what you can see here, we have a, a CD4 antibody conjugated to the Nova Yellow 610 and CD8 conjugated to the Nova Blue 610. And we're able to compare, um, he was able to compare staining with both beads and cells and look at the performance versus other dyes. So this is a real head-to-head -head comparison. So what you can see here is just a number of the dyes that were tested. Uh, this, was, this testing was done on a Symphony X50. Um, and so these are um, all the, the comparisons that were made. Um, and so when you delve into it, here we have our CD8 Nova Blue 610 uh, dye conjugated, uh, sorry, our Nova Blue 610 conjugated to a CD8 antibody and um, the BB630 also in com comparison. And what you can see here in blue is uh, our, our label and in black is the um, BB630 label. And what you see is that um, our label is actually quite bright, not quite as bright as the BB630 comparator, which is an incredibly bright label. But what is pretty astounding is how quiet it is in the background, and that's um, really critical. So we can build out the brightness. Um, and again, I'll talk more about that in terms of um, actually optimizing what, what you need for your usage. But um, that's something that can be dealt with. But um, when, it's, when you have too much spillover, that's not something you know, that can be subtracted um, afterwards, um, other than through compensation, which again, starts to add up and affect what you're seeing. So um, this just shows how little background we have in our Nova Blue 610. Um, and then this is showing our Nova Yellow 610 with some other comparators. So um, an Alexa Floor 694 dye, um, the PE, um, uh, the PE Dazzle or PE CF 594 dye, um, and also an ECB. And in pink, it's showing the primary detector. So you can see how bright this is. Um, this is actually one of our um, brighter labels and you can see it compares well with a number of these dyes. Um, it's indicated in this sort of orangey yellow color, um, but also its um, background is quite low when you look at that versus other um, dyes that are here. So in terms of fluorescing in other channels that we don't want to see, it's actually, um, there's not a lot of spillover. And in fact, Steve um, has did this analysis looking at uh, the spectral spillover and um, what you can see here is that it was actually in the Nova Yellow 610, uh, this was lower than all the other dyes that were measured on the beads. Um, there's a little more, more spillover with the Nova Blue um, 610 comparator, but um, it's, you know, they're both lower than a number of the other uh, competitors, direct competitors out there. So, um, so this now is an indication 
Um, we use the term brightness all the time, but what, what does that really mean? Well, in terms of thinking about a measurable way to think about brightness, there's a separation index. And what you can see here, this is just a mathematical way of looking at, you know, when you compare your negative and your positive um, and are using this dye and this, you know, with, with the same antibody, how quote unquote bright or um, separated, sorry. Sorry, it's how, how separated are your, um, uh, is your positive and your negative. And what you can see here is that um, the Nova Blue 610 and Nova Yellow 610 are actually pretty similar to APC in terms of the, that brightness. So that's actually really impressive. And uh, the fact that we can even build that out more um, really adds to the value that it has. So as you think about, um, you know, what do you want in a dye? It's sort of like thinking about what you want in a lab mate. You want them to be um, bright and clean. You know, if they're dim and messy, you've got issues because, you know, it's overflowing onto your bench. Um, and, you know, um, it's even, you know, worse if, if <laughs> um, they really affect your experiments by being dim. Um, so anyway, what you can see here is just showing this um, and in terms of looking at spillover versus separation index, um, we have here the Nova Blue 610 um, and it's uh, more in the dim and clean area. And this is relative again, versus its competitor. If you look, um, you know, here at the Nova Yellow, you can actually see that this separation index is still actually quite good. Um, and this is just showing their head-to-head -head competitors. Uh, so the Nova Yellow 610 really falls into this bright and clean area. Um, the Nova Blue 610, um, in terms of its competitor, um, dim but clean, um, but it's actually quite bright when you put it on the scale of some of these other dyes. This is just really showing how bright this other comparator is. So uh, in addition to base, uh, wanting a dye that is both uh, clean and bright, um, we also want it to be stable. Um, so we actually did you know, an experiment um, in terms of uh, shipping this three days without ice uh, in the summertime. And you know, one of those uh, experiments that happens uh, by nature um, so what you can see here is that there was only a 9% loss in fluorescence. And this really relates to the stability that's, um, that comes from the phyton structure. So this DNA structure really provides a backbone for the fluorescence and um, keeps, keeps it um, basically in a conformation that um, is less affected by this. Oh. Um. Oh, uh, so yeah, um, your question, um, is the fluorescence affected by fixation? No, actually, I'm going to show you on the next slide. Um, you can see, one sec, um, actually, this is showing the stability um, first, um, actually, after we left it on the bench for 14 days, you can see there's very little change. Um, where did it, it, oh, sorry, and um, I have a slide on fixation. Um, one sec. Where did it go? Well, anyway, basically the, the fluorescence is actually unchanged. Um, so this is fixed. Um, I thought it was a separate slide, but this is actually fixed. Um, and even 14 days out, it's really unchanged. So um, we've used 2% paraformaldehyde and 1% formalin and really don't see much of a change in that. So um, this is also showing that you can basically leave it out on the bench um, and there's very little change as well. Um, so. Okay, I don't know why my slides keep changing. Sorry about that. Um, so in terms of the um, looking at the brightness, um, you can actually tune these. Um, so our dyes are actually quite interesting because we are uh, setting up these dyes by design using um, basically specific fluorophores in these clusters. 
um, and setting up the, the fret uh, distance by which they're fluorescing, um, you can either have them tunable with one, two, or even four clusters. And so the brightness is really specifically tunable um, for your experiment. Um, and um, you can actually, this is showing um, data showing that um, because the phyton has a very specific structure, this first one is just showing that we can switch where the um, floors are located and replicate the um, basically the same fluorescence pattern. Um, and here is showing, so these are both one clusters, just different locations. And here is data showing uh, one cluster versus two clusters. And this is a, um, you know, a spectra. So of course the question is, how does this look by flow cytometry? You can see that, you know, we've doubled the fluorescence, but um, let's look at the data on some cells. So what you can see here, um, this is showing the one cluster, Nova Blue 610, um, conjugated to CD3 antibody, um, or the Nova Blue 610 two cluster conjugated to the CD3 antibody. And what you can see here is that um, the comparison of the two, so we have the proper controls, FMO, label only, um, and then CD3 plus the label, so we're not having a large, large amount of background here. Um, and remember, this is on a log scale, but you can see that we're actually seeing twice the fluorescence. Um, so this actually, you know, really is a truly tunable system. And um, so we can also go to a four cluster system. So this is showing you um, in the spectra, again, going from the two cluster to the four cluster, we're again doubling that brightness. Um, and actually, when you normalize that, there's actually less uh, spillover. So it really is very high performance. It doesn't introduce um, a lot more spread by doing this. Um, and this is a specific experiment comparing it head to head with PE. So Nova Yellow 610 is um, most similar to, to PE in terms of our different floors. And uh, and what you can see here, I'll just go through this in a little bit more detail, um, that the Nova Yellow 610 two cluster, um, you can see it's MFI. And if you go to the four cluster, you've actually then doubled what you're seeing in the channel of interest. And when you look at PE, um, it's actually similar to um, that brightness. Um, Whereas we don't have many off-target off effects in either the um, yellow laser excited channel or a, another blue laser um, excited channel. So really in terms of that cross excitation that you would have with PE, it's, it's equally uh, similarly bright, but you have less of that uh, bleed over into your other channels. So uh, we actually now have a four cluster Nova Yellow 610, which is currently in beta testing. Um, and we really see this as being helpful in small particle um, and extracellular vesicle detection. So that's a place where brightness is really at a premium. And um, also that um, PE and PE conjugate replacements, um, it can actually help detect um, drug targets. So um, for instance, antigens like PD-1, which become an issue in terms of brightness um, when you're looking in, in cancer trials. Um, this might be a way to really look at the limit of detection um, and um, really see what's happening in terms of um, expression. I think to some extent we're limited by the resources that we've been able to use. And now we can really look specifically at um, you know, the questions that I think we've been able to speculate on up until this point. So um, it's really exciting um, to think about what we can do with this. So not only can we look at the two and the four cluster in terms of brightness, this is just uh, basically a one-to-one -one in terms of our label um, with an antibody and the two or four clusters. But you can see here in terms of the degree of labeling, um, we actually, have conjugation kits and are at, will um, actually can control whether we add, you know, one or two labels to an antibody and actually can tune brightness that way. So there's really two different strategies to turn up that volume knob. So um, we've really done all these things. Um, we have bright and clean labels. Um, 
that limit laser, you know, extra um, laser excitation um, and um, they're consistent and stable and we're able to control brightness. And this is just a slide here showing uh, the uh, possibility that we can actually go forward with. So um, having these narrow signatures um, is great in terms of conventional flow cytometry. Um, but as we start to think about building out the spectrum in more spectral cytometry, we can actually even tune that. So this is just an example showing this idea that we can actually uh, use multiple different floors. And if we need to create a unique signature, we can do that. So um, that's a lot of um, really ability to be able to tune both the brightness and the other uh, one question here. How big is a phyton? Yeah, how does it compare its size to other um, dye molecules on the market? So a phyton, um, I think, is uh, 29 nanometers. It's, uh, I believe, similar in size to, um, I believe it's similar in size to uh, P. Actually, I think it's similar in size to PE. It's similar in size to actually the size of an antibody. Um, so it's, it's basically similar to what's already being used um, in terms of that. So. All right. Sorry. So, so yes, this is another question. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry. It's 20 nanometers across 120 kilodalton. So, yeah. All right. So, um, sorry. There we go. All right, so what does this mean in terms of panel design? Um, so, you know, if we have this, what do we need to think about? So we've uh, been used to sort of thinking about, okay, let's get the brightest labels with uh, the lowest antigen density, what's limiting in terms of being able to um, use our ant um, antibody labels. So are there only certain colors um, available? So once we have this tunability, um, what what do we you know think about in terms of really designing a panel? Um, so you know right now we try to even out the the you know the signals that we have. So in terms of you know brightness dimness balancing that out um, so we can see the population of interest. Um, I have, that slide really wants to come up for some reason. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, and, but we're, we may still be missing things. So um, with other labels, you know, with the cross excitation and spillover, um, this can really lead to difficult data analysis. So, you know, how can we truly think about designing a panel now that we've, you know, really changed how the dyes are acting? So thinking about a clean start. So this is showing a uh, TBNK panel um, with our Nova floors or a commercially available TBNK panel. And you can see there's a lot more noise already in these uh, fluorophores. But when we wanted to do a head-to-head -head comparison, this is just with beads showing um, our, our labels and um, how they are really specific to the channel of interest. Um, and then using that, you know, the measurement of their brightness um, in that, you know, again, um, truly measuring that rather than just um, looking by eye. Um, so this is the MFI of the positives um, in each of the, for each of these um, antibodies. So, you know, CD3, CD4, CD8, um, really looking at how bright those are. And then if we think about actually doing this, um, not the way we've traditionally done it by matching these things up, but actually as a, an exercise, how would we measure that if we actually looked at all the available possibilities? And what you can see here um, to measure that is a sum of all the off-channel fluorescence um, compared with the sum of the primary channel fluorescence. And this is a way to really sort of mathematically measure what we're seeing in terms of, you know, how, how do we design the best panel? Um, and um, if we think about this in terms of comparing the off-channel fluorescence with the primary channel fluorescence, you know, you can go from, you know, epic and amazing to serviceable, but if you've got, you know, a lot of off-channel fluorescence, um, it's really hard to see. And if, um, so that's where you get into this oh my category. 
Um, so when you actually computationally compare, um, so if we use our conventional method, this is where you know we end up um, initially. But if you could do this computational method and actually use um, the lowest off-channel, um, you can actually design a better panel. And so this is just an example of um, what is commercially available um, versus what we've designed in terms of our panel. And so I'm going to show you um, just quickly this, sorry. Um, and what you can see here is that um, on the top, well, my computer hates me, sorry. Um, <clears throat> you can see on the top that um, you have gating on, um, this is using a commercially available panel and on the bottom is our, our panel that we've designed. And you can see here gating on CD45, uh, and then CD4 versus CD8, um, and CD19 versus um, CD16 and 56 in the same channel. And so what you can see is that, you know, there are, this is compensated, but there's still some issues in terms of the tandem you can see here. Um, but we really have a good separation in terms of this, this could be optimized. We could use another, um, I think this might be a one cluster, I'm not sure, but it, um, we could optimize that in terms of making that brighter. Um, but you can see, we really do have good separation. Um, in, in this process of designing a panel. And one of the things, just a sort of advertisement for the future, I'm gonna be giving um, some webinars in the future on panel design with our Nova floors. And so um, part of what I wanna do is really look at, you know, what is our you know, panel that we might be using in our day-to-day -day and how can you drop in our dyes and really make that process better um, and really be able to ask more questions, the, the ones that, you know, often you think, okay, if I could just get one more channel, you know, I could ask this question. And we're going to be able to do that with our, uh, that's uh, just, if, you know, to come. Um, so I'll be talking more about panel design and actually um, this was generated before I was at Phytonics, but I'll be actually generating some panels um, on the Fortessa and the Attune and able to look uh, forward at what you're doing. Um, uh, can you combine phytons with conventional fluorochromes? Yes, absolutely. And that's uh, part of what um, that I want to really be, you know, showing you guys. So I'll be giving a webinar and showing that. But yes, we actually are doing that. And I'll even have some data um, with some other dyes um, that is going forward. Um, any steric hindrance have we noticed? Um, so uh, really, we haven't run into that yet. Um, we think the place where um, we're curious about it is, you know, looking in the intracellular space. But the, um, so that's one of the open questions that that's one of the things I'm actually in process of trying to do. Um, and it's just a matter of, um, you know, getting the antibody conjugated and running the test. But these are actually all of the size of floors you've been normally using. So um, there's no real problem that we've run into at this point in terms of that. So, um, so then the question that I wanted to really address um, was, hold on. <laughs> Sorry, really building out uh, the, the Nova floors, just an answer to your same questions that you're asking. So in terms of dye performance, um, I'm actually going to work backwards. I decided to start with a huge panel and, and build out towards that with the idea that if we can show we can drop our dyes into a panel like this, we can really, um, you know, show that in, you know, say your Fortessa tune, you know, all your conventional cytometers. Um, so what I decided to do to really test our Nova floors is look at, this is a panel that um, was generated by SciTech. Um, this is in their most recent brochure for the Aurora. Um, and it's a 35 color panel. They've done a great job in terms of building that out. And the question I really want to see is, could we drop our dyes into this, use um, basically antigens, um, you know, match them up in terms of looking at the cells. So this is looking at um, human peripheral blood mononuclear cells, um, looking at basically B and T cells, uh, monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, NK cells. So um, it's a great phenotyping panel. And so this is built using uh, 
again, the Cytec Aurora system where it's looking at spectral cytometry. So there are places where you can obviously see as you look through it that you couldn't do that with a traditional flow cytometer because some of these dyes overlap and you can use the signature. But that's exactly what I want to do is really see, okay, can we do this, you know, drop our dyes into what you're doing. You won't have to really work to make this, um, to incorporate this into your panel. So um, this is, this next slide um, is uh, just showing uh, this, the idea, basically there was one uh, dye um, conjugate that was not commercially available. So basically in that panel, in terms of replicating it, we could get 34 of the 35. And then um, basically I went through, looked at sort of, you know, in terms of panel design, uh, looked at what markers are expressed. So trying not to make sure, make, have a lot of co-expressed markers. Um, for instance, CCR4 is, is found on uh, CD4 positive T cells. And um, so looking at, you know, what other, you know, T cell markers were nearby for at that particular uh, place in the panel. So either at a similar fluorescence, um, either on, the, on that same laser or at other lasers. And so I just looked at um, basically slotting our dyes into that. And uh, in, I've run that panel for the uh, first time uh, on Friday and finished uh, um, basically acquiring all of the single color controls yesterday. So um, basically I would say that is a, you know, coming soon, um, but we want to, take that data and make it publicly available um, and really, um, you know, show what, you know, what's working and what's not um, so that you can really see, you know, a, a show me the data kind of example. So um, that's just one of the, the things that I think has been really exciting about working here is really asking the questions um, that I didn't, you know, really think that people would just ask straight off and we are, um, because we can iterate our dyes, we, um, the chemists um, and all of that are basically generating new dyes. Um, and uh, right now we're focusing on the blue and yellow lasers, but um, we really can do this dye by design and this is gonna change you know, how you look at your panels. So this is just showing the spectra. Um, so this is a Cytex viewer. Um, of dropping our Nova, Nova floor dyes, so the Nova blues and Nova yellows, um, into this 30, 34 color panel. And you can see um, it's definitely going to be testing what can be unmixed, um, but um, you can also see how unique some of these dyes are, you know, specifically, for instance, the Nova blue 610, you can see there's almost a, like a hole in the spectrum there. Um, so, you know, uh, more information is coming, basically. So, um, in summary, um, I wanted to, you know, point out that this is really going to change, you know, um, panel design and expand, hopefully, the way you can use and do your experiments. So, again, you know, our, the, the dyes are bright and clean, consistent and stable, and there's a controllable brightness. And um, these are just our initial product offerings. Um, you can see we have the Nova um, CD4 Nova kit, and this has each of our dyes conjugated to a, a human CD4 antibody. Um, so you can test it in your system and see if the dye works um, and see slot it into your panel of interest um, or look at the spectrum, you know, on the Aurora. Um, we also now are offering the Nova Floor conjugation kit. And uh, one thing I want to say coming from an immunology background is this conjugation kit is really straightforward and works. Um, and I say that because I have um, it, at various other times in my career dealt with conjugation kits that aren't straightforward or don't work. And um, basically in the first step, you know, if you think about our phyton being this DNA structure, uh, the conjugation in some ways goes as you might expect. Uh, there's an oligo that's conjugated uh, to the antibody and um, hold on one sec I will get to your question one sec and um, then you can actually add uh, the um, basically the phyton of interest um, basically there's a three-step process just to add the oligo and then um, basically wait overnight and then uh, do the next steps to basic to add um, the you know nova blue or nova yellow dye of, your, of interest okay so in terms of the question i'm getting here um 
So, hold on. With respect to brightness, is, is this a custom specification or readily available? Um, that's a good question. So right now we are um, building out and selling our um, two, um, two, sorry, uh, two arm dies. I'm sorry, <laughs> blanking on the word, um, but um, we are gonna be selling our four cluster at some point. That right now, the, the two cluster is, the readily available um, thing. So we can build out the four cluster um, for a custom. Um, and more is definitely coming, so, all right. Then, um, and this last one is um, showing that we can actually do a custom conjugation. In this case, it's for a milligram or more of conjugated antibody. Um, so we can do this per request, um, or you can get the conjugation kit and have the six labels. Um, and definitely there's more to come. You know, please come see us at AAI and CITO um, to talk about your, your questions. Um, oh, what does the 2.2 uh, micromolar mean on the CD4 vials? So um, we are actually giving, um, the uh, concentration of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking closely at the, at the image now. Um, I believe that's the concentration of the antibody for staining. So um, in, uh, this has been titrated in the, oh wait, no, no, sorry, this is, the conjugation kit. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is the, I'm sorry, I was looking at something else. I wasn't sure which, which question you're asking. I think the problem is that this is shown twice. That's where the problem is, comes from, is that's for the CD4 test kit. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's actually the, um, the concentration of the floor labels. Um, yeah, so I think part of the problem though is that we have, um, this, yeah, yeah. So it's it, in the CD4 kit, um, basically they come and you can add 0.5 uh, microliters. Um, that's where the testing has been. Um, we generally recommend using two microliters, but that's, that's what that is. Um, and, sorry, let me see if there's any other question. Okay. So, yes. So anyway, um, that, we've got more questions, sorry. What is the quality control for Lurie's criteria of the phyton conjugation? Yeah, absolutely, good question. Um, so we actually test um, everything that we send out on cells. So we actually, you know, we'll show a plot of what, um, you know, the staining looks like on our you know, cells in this case um, for the CD4 kit. Um, the uh, conjugation, so if we're doing the conjugation, we are going to you know, actually send you, you know, your specific um, antibody you know, with, with the right control. Um, so, um, but in terms of the, the phyton conjugation itself, so if you're buying the, say, the conjugation kit, I'm assuming that, what that that's, that's what that question is, but feel free to follow up if I'm not answering that correctly. Um, so in terms of the, the phyton conjugation, um, you'll, basically it's a, you know, a, a two-step process. So basically there's three steps in which um, you will add the oligo, um, which then gets added to the antibody in a very controlled chemistry, basically, and you can let that go um, at room temperature overnight. Um, our partner has actually designed this conjugation kit and has experience doing this with, you know, basically this, this chemistry very specifically. And so they're using it in their case um, to, you know, even add barcodes um, to antibodies. But the, the cool thing is that we have a very specific, um, so the oligo is added, and then there's a second step. So first off, we're actually testing our phytons themselves. So the, each of the floors is tested in terms of quality control. And so even before that gets added, this is being you know, tested, and uh, we have information that this is consistent. Um, one of the things that's really been impressive about the system is, is really how stable it is. Um, and so it um, we haven't really seen a lot of 
lot, you know, we haven't seen really lot to lot, you know, variability in terms of this. Um, but anyway, in terms of the conjugation, um, so then the phyton and the oligo conjugated antibody are mixed together and basically um, you bring those to a specific temperature to reduce annealing, but not, you know, it's basically, I think it's um, 50 degrees. Um, and so that, you know, we've tested doesn't affect the antibody at that temperature and basically then cool it um, from there, sort of similar to what you do in a PCR reaction, but over a much slower time window. And that's how straightforward the conjugation is because it's occurring with a very specific sequence um, that's really going on. So um, those are the steps that we're following in terms of, of all of that and trying to measure each step. But if, if you have any concerns, part of what we really want to do is, you know, be listening. So if, if there's anything you have questions or concerns with, we're here. So, you know, please, please ask. Um, but that's, that's, I think, hopefully answer your question. If I haven't, please let me know. So, um, yeah. And I think in terms of the talk, you guys are asking great questions, by the way. Um, that's really where, where we are. That's where I was hoping to, to end anyway. Um, you can see, my uh, email address on the screen. Um, I'm always available for answering questions. There's obviously some more questions that have come in, um, or you can reach uh, us at info at phytonics.com. So, um, all right. How do you control for the number of phytons bound to the antibody? Good question. So um, the point is that we're actually controlling with the uh, oligo conjugation. So we're actually in that first step um, really going through and controlling based on the amount of antibody and the amount of oligo and the specifics of the chemistry, you know, how um, that conjugation is occurring. And so because it's the phytons then are um, added based on this oligo, matching oligo strand, um, controlling the, the oligo conjugation to the antibody is really that critical step. And so um, currently a lot of the data that you've seen has actually been at a ratio of one antibody to one phyton. Um, and so uh, that's one of the things that um, we can do by controlling the amounts that are added. That's how you control the number of oligos uh, that can be added. And so that's one of the things we're looking at going forward is, you know, um, optimizing. Of course, at some point there would be some amount of steric hindrance. You can't, you know, add an unlimited number of phytons. Um, but you certainly can add more than, than the one. So that's um, how that is controlled. Um, and you can actually see that. Um, so we have chemists that have done size exclusion chromatography and are specifically looking at those questions. All right. Any other questions? All right, well, you're welcome. <laughs> I'll just hang out. Um, so if you have any other questions, feel free to ask me. All right, got another. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, thank you for coming. So, um, but yeah, if um, please reach out. You know, so if if more, let's see. What do we got? Are we, oh yes, are we planning to develop new Nova floors? Absolutely. Uh, that's one of the really exciting things about being at Phytonics is that we're doing this over the course of months, not years. So um, we're uh, continuing to really build out uh, what dyes are there. Um, so our chemists are working amazingly hard at um, testing new uh, dyes. And one of the cool things from my end as a research application scientist is I can take those and test them in, you know, our panels, see how they work for flow cytometry. Um, so it's, for me, it's like being a kid in a candy store, being able to look at the kinds of dyes that we're developing. So yes, we're absolutely developing new Nova Floor dyes and really will continue to build out the spectrum. More questions, All right, hold on. Um, with a high negative charge of the phyton, is there any issue with background nonspecific staining in any assays? Good question. Um, so we really haven't um, 
had too much of an issue, but there is one thing to be aware of, and it has, we, we believe, less to do with the phyton, but rather to do with um, some of the dyes involved. Um, so if you imagine the phyton, and basically, you know, because again, this, this fluorescence is being generated through fret, um, there are um, basically, you know, dyes that are contained in the, the DNA structure. These are conjugated to the DNA structure. And um, we, you know, don't release the specifics of that. But in some cases, um, as is known for some of the cyanine dyes, there is an issue um, of background. And so what we have developed is Nova Block. And um, you can add this to your samples. But the great thing is it doesn't take up a lot of volume. Um, so like the Brilliant Violet and some of those, um, they recommend adding 50 microliters per sample. Well, you should start to build out big panels. That actually takes up a good deal of space. So um, we found that sometimes the monocytes um, and, and macrophages um, likely through CD64, although um, it could be another, um, there is some background and it seems related to the cyanine dyes. So we recommend using the Nova block um, and that should be used in your staining, but um, you can add five microliters per sample. So not really an issue. And we do provide Nova block when you buy your conjugation kit or the CD4 kit. Um, all right, more. Let's see, how, how do the Nova floors res respond to freezing and drying, freeze drying? Um, that is a good question. I, I'm wondering if we have test, I don't know if we've tested that. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I'm not, I'll, I'll check on to find out if we have done anything with that. We have not tested it, I guess. Um, so yeah, I would think like most floors, um, I guess it would just be things that would have to be tested, but I, I don't think that's something that we've done yet. All right. Um, we have tested lyophilization though, and the platform is very stable. So um, whatever. Uh, other members of the company is helping me answer that question. So yes, we have tested that um, specifically in terms of lyophilization. So yeah, any other questions? I'll hang out for a little bit, um, but again, feel free to email me if you have any other questions that I can answer or even a follow-up. And I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, you know, they, oh, I feel like we always get such good questions. It's, it's a great, great uh, group of people that have attended. So I really appreciate it. All right, so we have another question. Uh, the data we showed was generated on which cytometry platform? Well, good question. Um, so we had different um, platforms. So one uh, at the beginning, I think when I was showing you the NIH data, that was generated on the uh, Symphony, um, which is a um, BD, very large, um, basically has a large number of lasers and um, detectors, but is still a conventional cytometer. Um, we have also shown data uh, oftentimes using the Attune, which is one that we have access to. Um, I'm trying to think if we've shown any for Tesla or LSR2 data. Um, and then I've also obviously been testing it uh, on the SciTech Aurora system. So we've used it on a large number of platforms. And actually in terms of uh, the talk that I'll be giving you know, in April, looking at panel design, I'm gonna uh, really be focusing there in terms of looking at, you know, for Tessa Tune, if you have your cytometer of interest, I can look ahead of time at what filters are there and, you know, help provide um, some advice towards that. So that should answer that question. Anything else? Yeah, 
really great questions. All right, so if there are, I'll probably wait another minute and then if you um, want to contact me, please, you know, contact me, follow up with any questions that you have. Question. Will this presentation be available for distribution? Um, yes, I believe so. Um, so I will find out the details of that, but we, I think, should have your emails from the registration. So um, just get in touch and I think we can do, make that happen. So. Um, all right, another question. Thank you. Uh, Appreciate the feedback. Thank you for coming. All right, so if there aren't any other questions, let me make sure. Okay, so yeah, please reach out and I'm gonna end this, this uh, presentation now, but thank you so much for attending. I really appreciate it. Um, we look forward to hearing from you if you have more questions. <laughs>